Okay, good morning, everyone. Representatives of medical schools, medical students, employers, and universities stakeholders. Very warm welcome to, the, to this final seminar of uh, the evaluation of medical education in Finland. My name is Hannele Seppälä, and I work as a vice director at FINEEC and also as a head of the higher education unit. And uh, I had also opportunity to work as a project manager in this evaluation. The results of the evaluation will be published today. The chair of the evaluation team, Professor Mariukka Mäkelä, will present the main results. And uh, we'll also hear presentations of the, uh, uh, of the evaluation team members. Uh, after break at 11.30, 11 uh, we will also hear comments from the representatives of all five medical education units. And then we'll have time for discussion too. The Minister of Social Affairs and Health, Pirkko Mattila, will deliver closing remarks at uh, half past 12. I wish you all very good seminar and hope and I hope that we'll have fruitful discussions today on how to develop the medical education further in Finland. Now I will give uh, the floor to director of FINEC, Harri Peltoniemi. Please. So good morning ladies and gentlemen participants of the final seminar of the first national evaluation of uh, undergraduate medical education in Finland, which was uh, carried out by Finnish Education Evaluation Center in 2016-2018. Uh, the main uh, aims of evaluation or evaluating the undergraduate medical education were to produce an overall picture and information on the current state, strengths and challenges of the education. And uh, the other aim was to develop recommendations that uh, reflect the changing competence requirements in a doctor's work and their future operating environment. An additional aim was to identify good practices in the evaluated areas to support development work in units providing medical education. This evaluation is based on the principles of enhancement-led evaluation, which is very important leading principle in uh, FINEX activities. It's emphasizing active participation and trust between FINEC evaluation team and evaluation participants. In this case, in this evaluation, Enhancement-led evaluation means that we have had representation of all medical faculties in the planning team. And uh, the principle of collecting evaluation materials has been a multi-perspective. That means management, teachers, researchers, students, stakeholders have provided evaluation team with information. And the uh, preliminary results of the evaluation have been discussed with the faculty members and representatives of Finnish Medical Students Association in March 2018, this year. Now I have the great pleasure to introduce you to the evaluation team. Professor Mariukka Mäkelä, is the chair of the 
team and uh, he comes from the National Institute for Health and Welfare in Finland and also University of Copenhagen. And we have Associate Professor Rita Müller, University Medical Center, Groningen, the Netherlands. Look. No? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because now uh, Professor Gerda Crusset comes from Medical University Medical Center, Groningen, but uh, unfortunately she is not here with us today. I'm sorry. <laughs> and Medical Director Elmo Haavisto, Satakunta Hospital District, Finland. <laughs> and uh, Emeritus Professor Christopher Stephens, University of Southampton. And now I don't mention the country because I'm not really sure. <laughs> Great Britain, maybe I can say. <laughs> and then uh, medical student Joel Telke, University of Helsinki. And uh, Joel is the representative for uh, Finnish Medical Students Association. And from FINEC, Finnish Education Evaluation Center, Evaluation Counselor Hannele Seppale. You met already Hannele. And Senior Advisor Kirsi Mustonen. And Senior Advisor Mira Husko. And uh, <clears throat> The basic work was done by the planning team and um, Professor Katrina Nuström from Aalto University was chair for the, for the planning team. And uh, Katrina represents also Finnec. She is a member for um, um, Higher Education Committee of Finnec. And in the planning phase we had a, as project manager uh, Kirsi Hiltunen from Finnec, but I think Kirsi is not here today, no. Okay, but now it's time for main results of the evaluation. Mariukka Mäkel, please. Good morning. Nice to see you here and I have met many of you during the evaluation process too. So it's time to tell uh, what the results of our ev ev evaluation are. It has been a very good journey through the Finnish medical education. Um, why have the medical, medical degree programs been evaluated right now? This is the first time ever in Finland and uh, the um, uh, Ministry of Education suggested the evaluation, the Ministry of uh, Social Affairs and Health was very happy about the idea and there has been good support from, the, uh, from all the organizations that are relevant, Finnish Medical Association, the uh, Medical Students Association. <clears throat> the reason why uh, this starts is that there, are, there have been organizational changes in the universities, but most of all, the major changes in the healthcare system, healthcare environment that we are meeting now. Digital, digitalization, decision support, means uh, large changes in how doctors will be working in the future. Personalized medicine or precision medicine, whatever term you wish to call it, uh, based on genetic information, is already changing uh, how we deal with patients and their diseases Teleconsultations, task transfer, there's uh, uh, the opportunity nowadays for a patient to, par to uh, visit uh, his or her doctor in a chat. Uh, and uh, that's a totally new way of handling medicine. And then task transfer from uh, doctors to nurses, uh, for example, uh, needs good thinking behind it. We have very proactive patients. Patients come with a print from, uh, from Google and to their doctors and say, why am I not treated 
being treated like this. Doctors need to participate in social media increasingly. And all these skills, all the skills that are needed in this environment should be given to the doctors when they are in training. Of course, doctors are never ready. It's a lifelong learning in our profession. Uh, but uh, the basic skills that they need uh, should be uh, very clearly given by the university training. And then, last but not least, the upcoming SOTE reform uh, will require that uh, doctors are ready to work in multiprofessional groups, lead those multiprofessional groups in the new environment. The framework of the evaluation was given, given to us by the uh, Finnish Evaluation Centre, Karvi, and uh, they have coordinated this very well, and I really want to thank you publicly for all the support and good thinking and understanding of education that you have provided to the group. Uh, the planning group, uh, as, we, as we heard, has uh, prepared the uh, uh, program for us, and the university representatives have been uh, in the planning group already saying, how should we be evaluated? This is an enhancement-led evaluation, like Harry said, uh, participation and trust are uh, essential parts of it and, and uh, in the end the universities are the ones who are going to make the change. So it's self-enhancement they are going to do. Uh, we, the uh, evaluation group, when we started our work uh, and got the experts in medical education from uh, three foreign countries, uh, one thing that we decided with, uh, uh, from their suggestion was that we also added selected World Federation for Medical Education quality improvement standards as part of the evaluation. And I think it made the evaluation even better than it would have been otherwise. The aims of the evaluation are to describe the current stage, state of medical ed ed education in the five universities to look for the strengths in these programs, good practices, but also to find how much variation there is. Universities are independent units, and they have developed five programs to uh, rather different directions, actually. You could see quite a lot of variation. I think everybody was surprised at how much variation there was. And uh, we have given recommendations, recommendations for development to support the university's own work in how to make teaching even better. And uh, there's a nice uh, song from The Hobbits, The Road Goes Ever On and On. If you go, go look at these slides later, you can hear uh, and remember that it's a never-ending story how you improve uh, education and think of the curriculum. The perspectives of evaluation, uh, we uh, have uh, heard four different stakeholders here to get a comprehensive picture. The university administration, medical school administration, medical teachers, medical students, and then the customers of the program, those who get the product from the universities, the newly educated doctors, the working life, whom Ermo has represented very well. And we have had a good dialogue uh, between all these, all these stakeholders and the evaluation team. This is the team that Harry already showed us. And uh, what we have done, first the universities uh, provided us with summaries of their curricula. And uh, the summaries were not short. When a medical uh, doctor is being trained, there are 5,000 hours of uh, learning over six years. So the description of all that is not short. Uh, the medical schools uh, did self-evaluation, the students did evaluation of the teaching, and then we read other background materials. Thank you to uh, Finnish Medical Association for providing a lot of useful information. And then we did a full-day evaluation visit to each school and interviewed these, uh, these four stakeholder groups. That was really interesting. Thank you for very good visits. And then in March we had a seminar to discuss the preliminary findings and, and uh, we uh, then wrote, finalized our report. So what are the results of the evaluation then? There are many areas of strength in Finnish medical education. 
Uh, all schools are very committed to improving the education. There are quality management processes in place already. Uh, there are, uh, they have identified drivers for changes, what is needed to be done. There are many good education practices to be shared. And from what I heard, the sharing started already during the uh, evaluation and has already made some changes in the programs. National collaboration is increasing. It's, it, it varies by specialty how much the uh, teachers in, in each medical school are communicating, but they're increasingly sharing materials. Uh, they have made, in some areas, joint analysis of the core learning contents, which is really useful, and they are sharing teaching materials. And as we, as, uh, as we said, there's a very strong student engagement. That's what especially our foreign evaluators said that it's unusual that students are so much involved in planning and evaluating the evaluation and Medicina Relito uh, says yes <laughs> here, the Finnish Medical Students Association. Uh, another good thing that is not in all European countries present at all is that there are in all schools there are clinical placements outside the university hospital. Students go to health centers, to uh, regional hospitals, to see how it actually works out there. And there are different patients, there are very good clinical teachers out there, fine teachers as role models. That's, uh, that's a uniform feedback from the students. Uh, areas of strength, and these are divided into the four areas that the planning group uh, has uh, given to us to look at. Planning of education and implementation of education here. Uh, all schools actually have a core curriculum content analysis, so they know what is in their curriculum. Student engagement is strong, uh, national collaboration is increasing, and then we do have national evidence-based guidelines, current care, käypä hoito, that provide much of the clinical content. In the implementation of education, the good things are early patient contact, often in primary care, it's an important start when a, when a uh, doctor, coming doctor, first comes to university and meets his or her first patient. It changes the role of the student profoundly, and it's very well done in all the faculties. There's a good variety of patient mix because the students have outside clinical placements, excellent collaboration with the outside teaching units, the universities train the teachers they're out there in the health centers, and then there's uh, a newly started joint digital study environment project for all medical schools, which is important in this digital age. Saves time for, for everybody. The two other areas, of, uh, er areas that we evaluated are competencies and working life skills and then continuous development and renewal. And the strengths here are that Finnish universities are good at teaching generic competencies such as communication skills, for example, to the students. They do it very, uh, very thoughtfully. There's good collaboration with primary health care, as, as uh, I already said, and there are many good practices of teaching and learning. There's mobile learning in many places. There's self-reflection skills are taught, which is an important meta skill for, for doctors. And many schools do interprofessional collaboration already at the teaching levels. They teach doctors, nurses, social workers, hopefully, in the future anyway, together to deal with the complex patient cases. There's a good mix of methods and processes in evaluating and renewing the education. And uh, as I said, there are collaborative groups that are developing national analysis of what should be taught to all students. And um, very active participation in the evaluation has been a strength here. We have felt that, uh, that we have been getting answers and ideas all along the road. The development priorities. And the biggest thing that we have to say today is that there's a, an urgent need to develop a national framework on joint learning outcomes that aims at the core curriculum that is shared nationally. And the core curriculum should be taught with increasing complexity from the very early start. It is not enough anymore to have each specialty 
plan their teaching content. Uh, we need to aim at a constructive alignment in the teaching, and this is the difficult word. I've learned a lot about education in this process. Uh, it means that you map the program outcomes, that, that you map the teaching content, think what the program outcomes should do, and then you make sure that teaching and learning activities actually produce those learning outcomes and that an integrated assessment strategy makes sure that every student gets that core content in teaching. Implementation of education. There is a lot of pedagogic uh, training already for those who teach medical students, but everybody should get that. All teachers out there in regional hospitals, and th there's variation in this. The students need structured feedback that supports their learning, especially when they are in clinical training. How did I do in this patient contact? What was good? Where could I have done better? And that needs one-to-one -one teaching from an experienced teacher to a student who's working with a patient. It requires time and resources. Uh, we need more shared e-learning activities across different virtual platforms. As we know, the IT systems are not always communicating, but uh, we, we need to have the content, the e-learning content, uh, to be shared. Uh, one of the important issues that is that internships, uh, when uh, people have clinical placements in, uh, late in the, in, the, uh, in the medical school, they should have structured learning outcomes. They, we, we should plan what they need to do there, and it should be assessed. And uh, then the strengthening of the interprofessional education that I already mentioned. Um, Yes, uh, ensuring the assessment of clinical skills and reasoning. Diagnostic work is the most important work for, uh, that the doctor does in, in the healthcare system, and this should be ensured. Uh, more community-based teaching. Uh, general practitioners should be given even a stronger role in curriculum development so that, so that they teach uh, out there instead of uh, uh, at, the, at the university. They can also teach at the university, of course. And modernizing the curriculum with more research skills and evidence-based medicine skills and health economics and patient safety and leadership and management skills, there's a lot of pressure to add there. So we need to think where to cut down also, or how to integrate this so you do both clinical things and management things at the same time. And in the continuous development and renewal, define the Finnish doctor. What is a Finnish doctor when he or she comes out of medical school? What are the core knowledge and skills he or she should have? Shared national program outcomes to support the SOTE reform also. Input from active working life. We should listen to those who uh, are uh, employing the new doctors. And, uh, then considering the quality of education as a performance indicator, like they do in, uh, in the UK universities. The universities get points not only for publishing, they also get points for how good teaching is. They have done that for 20 years, Chris? Something like that? Not quite that long. Anyway, long. We can learn from them. So, national core curriculum. Uh, making the 60-some different specialty areas into a compact whole so that, that we can weave them together. Core recommendations, defining the Finnish doctor, curriculum mapping and alignment, ensuring development of key skills, protecting the learning environment, and valuing teacher skills. And I look a little bit more into this, and I'm, uh, some of this is repetition, but that's est mater studiorum. So, currently we don't have a national consensus on what uh, is a Finnish doctor, how we are educated, how they are educated, and what they should master at graduation. The stru structure of medical curriculum varies between the universities, and there's a, there's a table in, in, the, uh, in the publication that shows, for example, the division of, uh, of uh, learning uh, amounts that is 
quite large. We need a consensus on the skills, attitudes and role of newly graduating doctors and medical schools should together take a leadership in defining the Finnish doctor. They should agree on key curricular outcomes and they should involve the key stakeholders to join in this development to have a shared vision of what doctors need to know. A curriculum is 5,000 hours, as I said. It's a sophisticated mixture of educational strategies, teaching and learning environments, course content, assessment strategies and learning outcomes. And then it's each, each student's, student's personal uh, learning style and their timetable that also define what they actually take out of the curriculum, because all 5,000 hours are not compulsory. Without mapping the curriculum, it will be a patchwork of modules that don't discuss with each other, there's no clear progression or plan, and strong subjects can claim more hours and money. We know it is also a fight about resources. If we teach more, we get more money from the university. Not a very useful way of planning the contents. Curriculum mapping makes, these, uh, makes the key elements of the curriculum and the relationships clear. Mapping supports the alignment of teaching and learning and assessment. And for the students, it becomes explicit what is the scope of learning, how much they need to learn, what they need to learn, and in what sequence they, they should be doing it. And the result will be more transparent. Mapping makes curriculum planning more effective for all, for, for teachers, for the university, and for the students themselves. A doctor's key task is diagnosing. Finding out what is the problem with the patient and how it should be treated based on the diagnosis. And that's why assessment of clinical skills and assessment of how well a doctor is able to reason in a real patient contact is essential for the learning. <clears throat> and that's why students need constructive feedback after real patient encounters. They also need readiness to think about new technologies with a critical attitude. They need the collaboration and teamwork skills and how, know how to manage difficult situations in a constructive fashion and then sit down after the difficult situation and discuss with the team how did it go, what could we have done, what should we do next time. We need to protect the learning environment. There's increased student intake and the budget and organizational change. Uh, no new teacher uh, positions and uh, that has meant larger student groups, which means less hands-on experience. If you have six students looking at the patient who has a, a belly problem, uh, everybody can get their hands on the patient's belly, but if there are 12 students, the patient is getting tired after number six. Um, personal feedback. And then, if students are getting problems, you need to recognize them early, do something. Uh, there's one university that has a very clear system that if a, if a student is uh, flunking exams, cannot follow the course, the, uh, the uh, teaching nurse picks the student up for a discussion and starts thinking with, with the student, how do we go on from here? and the necessary support and changes in the teaching plan should then be made. Valuing teacher skills. This is the, my other very strong message besides the uh, curriculum alignment. Medical school teachers, like all of us, have only 24 hours a day for teaching, research, clinical work and the rest of their lives. And uh, we need to find new ways of appreciating teaching. It's not enough that medical students give them uh, uh, applause, the best teacher of the year. The medical school should appreciate teacher skills, give uh, them positions to teach, find, uh, provide them with time for learning how to teach, participate in, in training. And uh, we need tenure tracks in medical teaching. We don't have any positions of medical teachers in the Finnish uh, universities today. And uh, 
I'm looking forward uh, to seeing which university is the first one that establishes a medical teacher position. Um, centers of excellence in medical education are uh, collecting, can collect uh, the uh, pedagogic learning. We have one uh, in, in Finland, another was closed down a little while ago, and uh, these such centers could support systematic pedagogical training for all who teach medical students, and it would be good to see such centers in all the medical schools. We have given feedback also to each school based on all the evaluation materials. We had, have tried to do triangulation between the materials and discussions uh, and uh, we have been weighing the comments actually from students. If students and teachers have disagreed, we have ended up in uh, writing down the students' view. Uh, the uh, final texts in chapter 5 have been reviewed by the individual schools for errors and misunderstandings. And, uh, and we, decide, we first discussed whether this should be uh, public material and then we decided that, uh, that this is one of the really important outcomes of our evaluation, that each school gets detailed feedback and it is made public. The schools can use it in how, how, to, uh, how to argue for what they need to be a very good medical school. And we really appreciate the time and sincerity and effort from everybody who has been participating in this evaluation. So what is the validity of our evaluation? Like I said, it's 5,000 hours of training over six years times five, and we have not been able to look at every detail in every training program. We hope we, we have seen the forest from the trees. And our task was to ask questions and point out possible methods of responding to the questions, to the problems that the schools themselves have identified. Only each university can actually give a final answer to the questions that arise from the evaluation in their specific context. And like I said, they already have started doing it during this process, which is fantastic. We encourage evidence-based planning, dialogue and openness, which has been a very typical feature in all of this process. Uh, good structure, uh, looking at assessment and collaboration between the universities. And when you renew your programs, the major thing is keeping in mind the working life into which the students are being prepared. The universities could also look abroad, explore international examples in medicine, and one of the discussions that we haven't had really is whether medical education really is an exception in the Bologna process, and Chris will talk a little bit more about this in his presentation. Educating doctors for the future. We think we are certain that the necessary changes in uh, renewing medical education can be done while protecting the unique flavor of each medical school. They don't need to be exactly the same. They need to have the same core content so that we know what a Finnish medical doctor is. But over and, ab uh, and above that, they can do all kinds of things that are in their profile. And now that the medical students are applying to all the schools at the same time, they probably will be choosing based on what the profile of the school is. So that can actually be made more uh, outstanding, clearer, uh, when the core, con core content has been defined. Uh, collaboration among the faculties is very active and it's very much needed. Each graduate must measurably get the skills to start their work as doctors, continue to specialty training. There are many careers that the doctor can have. You can go into research, management, medical education, health policy, and all of, all of uh, the doctors, uh, independent of which career they choose, they should enjoy the opportunities for lifelong learning. We are never ready in our profession. 
Ultimately, we think that the changes that we propose will improve the quality of the graduating doctors, increase patient safety, which is one of the things that Ermo has been continuously taking up in this process, and it will result in better medical care in Finland. Thank you, everybody who has participated in this work. And we have a few minutes for comments or questions. Yes. Uh, we should have a center of excellence yes. in medical education. Do you mean uh, that each university should have a center of excellence or should there be a national center of excellence in medical education? That's a very good question that I think the universities need to talk about with each other. One opportunity is that there is a national center of excellence that has sort of satellites in the different universities. But I think all universities actually need people who are interested in medical pedagogics and, and trained in that to oversee what's happening, what, what changes are happening in the, in the education programs. But it's up to you again. Other comments? Yes. Sara Launia. Hello and good morning. Uh, I'm here on behalf of uh, junior doctors in Finland and I would just like to express our happiness or joyfulness in this report. It's very welcome and timely and we look forward to uh, defining Finnish doctor for the future and we are very happy to see medical education and pedagogic skills so uh, um, so forward in this report and, and we really think that this is something that universities should, should address and also the leadership skills are something we are really hoping to see in the undergraduate curricula as well. Thank you. Thank you. That is so true that the, that the uh, uh, education, uh, education comes, uh, comes up here in both comments and, and we really need to think how to, how to also thank the teachers for all the work they're doing. There's lots of teachers here in the, in the audience and you know that the feedback you usually get is that you have done so badly when you have flunked somebody or when somebody, we don't flunk students, students flunk <laughs> if they don't know enough. But the typical feedback for a teacher is what should we do when a student has not passed the exam? And then there's the one teacher a year that gets a rose and thanks from the students. It's really, really not enough. <laughs> okay, we hope you can weave the blankets of, uh, of uh, teaching of the, of the curriculum so that it works for all the students and gets them ready. And then, uh, yes, Hannele. Thank you, Mariukka. Uh, next, we'll hear uh, evaluation team members' presentations, and they are going to, to reflect the evaluation results to international contexts and good practices. So what Finnish medical education could learn from international practices and principles. Uh, first, we'll hear Christopher Stevens' presentation on what is a Finnish doctor. Unfortunately, uh, Professor uh, Gerda Grosse uh, couldn't travel to Helsinki today, but Chris has promised to, to tell us also the <laughs> Dutch <laughs> model uh, and, and how to build a national framework of medical education on behalf of Gerda, please, Chris. Just adjust this because I'm a bit taller. 
thank you very much um, for the welcome and um, thank you all for uh, inviting me to be part of the team. It's been a, a very interesting and exciting year. I've seen a lot of different parts of Finland, met a lot of you, met a lot of students. I've experienced the winter and the summer. Uh, and last night we went and had a lovely dinner on one of the islands called... Yeah. Uh, and uh, when we came back about 10 o'clock, it was still bright sunlight. It was amazing. So um, I'm going to talk... Can you hear me OK? At the back, yes, good. I'm going to talk about what is a Finnish doctor, or more specifically, what is a doctor. Now, I have three daughters, so they're all grown up, but uh, so I'm kind of an expert on Barbie, so I'm looking forward to the Barbie uh, <laughs> exhibition after this. <laughs> I also know a bit about Cindy as well. I, I sort of trod on rather a lot of them as uh, they were dropped around the house. Uh, but my youngest daughter, Lucy, she works in the Dean Street Clinic in Soho. And uh, it's an NHS HIV and sexual health centre in the centre of London's sort of red light district. It's part of uh, the Westminster and Chelsea NHS Trust. And it is one of the biggest European centres for HIV and sexual health. And Lucy takes histories. She carries out examinations, investigations, she makes diagnoses, she prescribes, she's, she tests and gives bad news to people who have become HIV positive and manages their initial treatment. She carries out screening, other procedures, cauterization, and health education. And she's studying for this diploma in uh, sexual and reproductive health care. So you're probably thinking, why is he telling us about his daughter? Well, the reason is Lucy is a nurse. She's not a doctor. She got a degree in adult nursing four years ago at City University. Now, when I graduated, doctors diagnosed and treated. That was it. That's what a doctor did. But that's not so anymore. In, in the UK, anyway, there are a whole range of clinical specialists who are not doctors, who do a whole uh, range of things that doctors used to do. And that has implications for training and for uh, the numbers of doctors that you need. So in the UK, we sort of reviewed uh, in about 2005 medical training. And John Took was the dean of the Peninsula Medical School in, um, in Exeter and and Cornwall, and then became Vice Provost of University College London, one of the biggest, after Oxford and Cambridge, it's the biggest university in the UK. And he was asked to write a report called Aspiring to Excellence. And he recognised that workforce planning is really hampered by a lack of clarity around doctors' roles. So if you imagine that sexual health clinic and I'm the manager, how many Lucy's do I need and how many junior doctors do I need to train to become consultants in that specialist area? Without those sort of definitions, it's impossible to pr pursue an outcome-focused medical education or attempt to plan the workforce. So John wrote... He tried to sort of clarify what is a doctor. And a doctor's role is a diagnostic person. But one of the things that we do as doctors is handle clinical uncertainty. And to do that, we need this profound educational base in science, evidence-based practice and research. So what doctors do that is different from a nurse practitioner, a nurse practitioner follows protocols and guidelines. If they come to the edge of those, they refer to a doctor. And the doctors have to have the ability to work outside those guidelines if necessary and then justify what they did, if it comes to justifying it. <laughs> um, the other thing that doctors often are is a, a leader in a healthcare team. 
and that often means deploying considerable resources and they need management and leadership skills. So this is just a quick overview of medical education in the UK. Uh, four, five and six year undergraduate training. Four year uh, programmes are for graduates. We have a number of graduate programmes where people who have a degree, not necessarily a science degree, it can be a degree in humanities, uh, will come in and do a four year programme. The standard five year programme and then there are some six year programmes which are usually around widening participation. When the students graduate with their medical degrees, every doctor undertakes a two-year foundation program, which consists usually of six four-month rotations. That's before they go into any specialist training, before they do anything else. So every doctor gets this foundation and one of those rotations is in the community, either in general practice or in psychiatry, of a very broad experience. And then they go on to their general practice or other specialty training. And the regulation of this is covered by the General Medical Council. So the General Medical Council, as I'll explain in a bit later, actually allows university to award medical degrees and they can take it away as well. So there are a number of curriculum frameworks and you're probably familiar with a whole lot of them. This is the tuning project, the EU, that we all signed up to uh, and most of us don't carry out. This is the Scottish doctor that some of you are familiar with. Uh, the CanMeds program, which again is another criteria, but the one I'm going to talk about is the United Kingdom's GMC's Tomorrow Doc tomorrow's doctors. And in 25 years ago, in 1993, the General Medical Council published the first tomorrow's doctors. And I think this is very similar to what we have in Finland now. They recognised that medical schools were actually producing slightly different products. Uh, they had different sorts of assessments. They um, assessed different things at different levels, and there was no agreed core. And Tomorrow's Doctors has been updated and revised over a number of years. Uh, the, the latest version, which is called Outcomes for Graduates, uh, and you can get from the GMC's website, uh, came into effect for all medical schools in the UK from January 2016. And as I mentioned a moment ago, the GMC regulates all stages of a doctor's career. So the undergraduate, the postgraduate training, and then the continuing professional development. So as a doctor, I have a license to practice, and that, uh, in order to keep that license from the GMC, I have to do certain things, like have appraisals, do postgraduate studies, reflection, CPD, portfolios, and after five years, if I've ticked all the boxes, they'll give me another license to practice for five years. So it's quite heavily regulated in the United Kingdom. The training, both undergraduate and postgraduate, is also quite regulated by the GMC. Now, I just wanted to mention health system sciences. So again, when I was uh, a new doctor, there was clinical sciences and basic medical sciences. But over the years, particularly the last 10 years, health system sciences has become more and more prominent, uh, particularly around patient safety, and uh, from the USA. And it takes lots of uh, theories and messages from management, uh, sort of aircraft safety and things like that, about teaching leadership management, teamwork, um, interprofessional working and things like that. And I think we all need to build more of this into our curriculum. And that's a very good book, by the way, that tells you how to do it, <laughs> called Health System Science. So um, the, the GMC in Tomorrow's Doctors breaks down the doctor into three main roles. The doctor is a practitioner, a scholar and scientist, and as a professional. 
and looks at, in each of these areas, knowledge, skills, and professional behaviours. They don't talk about attitudes, because attitudes are in your head, behaviours are what you do and what people can <coughs> observe. So you might have bad attitudes in your head, but if your behaviour's all right, that's OK. <coughs> and you can design a curriculum that spirals and builds on these various uh, outcomes. And in our curriculum in Southampton, we have these themes of diversity, ethical law, teamwork, leadership, and patient safety and communication that sort of can be taught in any of the, uh, the various courses. So you could talk about diversity in a surgical attachment or ethics and law in obstetrics and gynaecology, and so on. So by next year, there will be an intake of 8,500 or so uh, medical students into UK medical schools, and there'll be 39 medical schools. The, the government have just created another new, five new medical schools. And um, they're all working to the graduate outcomes, the GMC's at graduate outcomes, but they're all very different. Some have uh, an intake of 80, some of 400. Some are problem-based learning, some are systems-based, integrated type uh, uh, learning modules. But they all have the same outcomes. So wherever that doctor works, once they graduate, they should be similar. So we've already heard a little bit about uh, the collaboration of stakeholders, but I think you need to decide what is a finished doctor. And it may be that you can take one of these models, and I mean, like tomorrow's doctors you could take, you could look at it and say, what do we need to add to, to give this a Finnish flavour, or are there things we need to detract that don't apply to Finland? And then from that, you could um, develop a, a shared national core curriculum of, of outcomes, and then work together to show that the outcomes are achieved. So I'm going to move straight on now. Oops. No, the lady up there is going to move me on, I think, to uh, Gerda's presentation. So if, if you go on to the next presentation. So unfortunately, Gerda's mother became very ill, and so she sent her, her uh, talk. Do you need me to do something? No. So if you go on to the next, next one... Next speaker, yeah. I'm having a rapid sex change. <laughs> Five minutes. For this one. Oh, I thought she had ten minutes, but I've overshot. <laughs> it's this one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's quite difficult to give someone else's presentation because you don't quite know what's in their head. But I'm going to do my best. So first I'm going to mention the Bologna Declaration. And uh, some of you will be very familiar with this, others less so. It's a two-cycle system, bachelor's, master's, and it basically allows for transparency of degrees across Europe, or even the world. And you can include it to a three-cycle system with a PhD. It produces these things, and actually, I think, seven out of the eight are provided by a medical program already. The one thing that isn't provided is mobility. It's very hard for students after a couple of years or three years to say, I want to go from Oulu to Helsinki, or from Helsinki to Tampere, or the same in the UK. It's almost impossible. Um, but the, the cut of having a, a three years bachelor's, then a three years master's, allows you to do that. 
they looked at medicine and the, and the, the um, process, and uh, quite a large number of medical schools and countries said, we don't want to do the Bologna Agreement. So 46 said no, 27 said yes, and 27% said maybe. Now, Finland, I think, said no, the UK said no, but the Netherlands said yes. The Netherlands is a little country just off the south coast of England. <laughs> that wasn't in the talk. It has, uh, it has eight medical schools, uh, and um, it's a small country, and, and basically, you get to Amsterdam, and you either drive south, and you're in Belgium and France, or, or the, to the east, and you're in Germany. But the, they produced a blueprint for all those eight medical schools uh, to define the sort of the Dutch doctor. And they used the CanMeds program, Performa, which has these sort of competencies, which are kind of fairly standard and similar to all the others. Uh, but they used the CanMeds. And they produced a sort of program like this. So three years bachelor, three years master with a research project with clinical aspects in both. And they also move from sort of lecture-based uh, approach to more uh, problem-based small group approach. This is across all the eight medical schools. So again, being student-centered, patient-centered, and the teacher acting more of a, as a facilitator. Now, Grunigan, where um, Gerda comes from, uh, has a number of hospitals, satellite hospitals, where they place students. And uh, we have a similar, in Southampton, we have uh, 12 or so satellite hospitals where the students spend probably 50 or so, 50% of their clinical time. And they, um, what you have to do is ensure that money follows the students, that the teachers are rewarded, supported and trained, and that you quality assure the placements. And it works very well. They also have one in the Caribbean, but I think that was, that's that one down there. So um, that summarises why the Dutch went for this. Uh, in addition, you have to have very good quality insurance, and you have this very much in yours. What you don't have at the moment is this external one. So in the UK, we have the internal process, as you do, but we also have, every five years or so, external visits from the GMC, in our case. In, in the Netherlands, it's different... Uh, well, an evaluation group rather like this from, from different medical schools. And this is the sort of thing that the big evaluation looks at, particularly whether the learning outcomes... Uh, are aligned and assessed because that's where things go wrong. They can do this progress testing and that just shows the, how it improves as you, the years go by. So e each one is a different cohort. I must admit, I find the, the progress test slightly difficult because when you're a first-year student, getting 5% or whatever it is must be a bit disheartening, but anyway... And those are the main advantages of the bachelor, master, two-year cycle, two-phase cycle. Transparency, integration, assessment linked with object objectives, and promotion of mobility. And as I, as I say, I think the first three you can do without the BM, the, the bachelor, master's break. The mobility is harder. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
you, Chris, and I'm very sorry to, to hurry up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, next, uh, uh, senior lecturer Rita Möller will tell us about the principles of assessment and uh, alignment in teaching, learning, and assessment. These functions, yeah. Huomenta, a very good morning, everybody. My topic today comprises principles of assessment, but in fact, it should be some principles of assessment because of the time limits we have today. Why all this talk about assessments? Because it's about quality. It's about quality assurance of the programs, of the institutions, and of course, of the universities nationally. It's also important because it's about accountability uh, to our society. The patient safety should be in focus when we talk about assessment. From the tiny little inhabitants after they have been burned, until we don't have any other uh, treatment than to hold somebody's hand. That's all that should be uh, included and tested. What do we mean with assessments? It's about measurement, and it's also documentation of students' learning progress. It's always a sample of how much of the expected learning outcomes of the course students have achieved. And it's also a process of making a judgment of the students. It's an important part of the whole assessment. So that's how we end up in the first principles. Assessments should be aligned with learning outcomes and expected competencies. It means in practice that we all have these learning outcomes in our syllabus or other guidelines. We should find the learning outcomes in the teaching and learning activities during the courses, and those learning activities should be aligned with assessments. So, perhaps learning outcomes one and two are those ones we can assess with the written assessments, or also we perhaps have to have practical assessment, essays, etc. But that's not the whole circle. Of course, the learning outcomes have to be checked uh, against the assessment system, and the assessment system should have an impact on what's in their courses, perhaps we have to review the teaching and learning activities, or we have to review uh, the learning outcomes. So, before you construct your assessment, define the learning outcomes and competencies uh, that are tested so that there is a consistency between the assessment and the outcomes. As you see, my lecture is a very back to earth, because I want it to be a very practical one, so you can get something with you. The purpose of assessments, there are lots of those. I have only taken uh, in my presentation two of those. Summative assessments, everybody knows it's about assessment of learning. They are usually at the end of the course, and they determine the student's achievement of the learning outcomes, and usually recorded as grades or scores. So it means that we have to decide if the students is allowed it to proceed in the program. Do the students have uh, uh, enough knowledge and competences to be able to continue in the program? One of the purposes is uh, uh, assessment for learning. It means formative assessments. <clears throat> they are usually done during the course, and together with feedback, it's aimed to shape the uh, students' future learning, and it's aimed to help the students to achieve their learning outcomes. They have to be made repeatedly, especially during, uh, if the students have uh, shown some weaknesses uh, in the area. So during the course, we help the students to take the next step and uh, uh, achieve the, uh, the learning outcomes when they are tested summatively. And that's how we end to the second principle, which is that formative assessments need to be connected 
to the system of the symmetry assessment. They can't be nothing else, there has to be alignment. It also means in practice that at summative assessments, like at OSCEFs, the students should not be exposed to situations that they have not trained before or given feedback for. Once again, you have heard this this morning already, the learning of the clinical skills and reasoning is a very central part of the medical program. And as we know that uh, feedback uh, promotes development, it's necessary to build a system of formative assessments with feedback in the programs. We just can't do the summative OSCEs without the students being able to train and give feedback. And that's how these assessments can help students to learn. Sometimes I think that even a system that's used at the airports or in the shops, the custom surveys, is better than no feedback at all. Just give the students some kind of hint of how they are doing. Then, how, how we are going to assess the students? It, of course, depends on the learning outcomes. It depends what is going to be tested, if it's knowledge, knowledge if it's skills or attitudes. I think most of you know this Miller's Pyramid. It's about how we uh, classify the learning outcomes, knows, knows how, shows and does. What we found out in the evaluation was that most universities had written summative examinations at the end of the course. And that's totally right. The knowledge base in, in medicine is huge. We have to have these written assessments. Specifically, if we have learning outcomes about no or now how. But if they write in the guidelines and the syllabus that students has to or sore, or I mean, do something, uh, take blood pressure, then we should have different kind of examination. It should be OSCE or simulation, if it is like in vitro real life situation, or if the learning outcomes are even at higher level, we should uh, consider workplace assessment of DOPS, direct observations. So, the third principle is, we need a variety of assessment times, the types to assess the different kind of learning outcomes we have. So you can see the direct connection between learning outcomes and the different assessment systems. Number four, we need criteria. The criteria for assessment should be detailed and students should know those in beforehand. Students, supervisors in the clinics, teachers, so students need to understand clearly what is expected of them when they are assessed. A curriculum at all programs and also in medical programs, they consist of a variety of courses. These houses here, they look quite the same, but they are all a little bit different. And that's how curriculum is um, constructed. That's what we found in Several uh, uh, medical programs, there are lots of courses, up to 60 courses in one, some. Uh, if all the courses construct their own assessments, this is how it's going to look like. And this is what students see. They are all different kind of traffic signs, they are all different kind of rules in different courses, and the it's really messy reality for the students, and it also leads to fragmentation of the or curriculum. There has to be some teachers who put the dots together so that students can see a uh, uh, road um, forward. So that's our principle number five. We have, we have to have an assessment system and we have to create it simultaneously when we create the learning outcomes. Some kind of system uh, that's based on evidence from the literature, uh, and it's a standardized system. And I tried to uh, create the one for you. Um, one possibility would be have an examination committee with the overall resp responsibility like for, or for proof printing or analyzing the results for curriculum development. Uh, 
I think most of the universities have what we call study year leaders with their committees. They could have the responsibility for blueprinting and allocating the items. Item, items mean questions. And finalizing the assessment. And then we need the course leaders and the teachers writing the questions, the items, based on the learning outcomes. And uh, people and teachers are afraid in that kind of system that they will lose their autonomy. But this is not about the autonomy. This is just to share the knowledge the teachers have and make it easier for students. I mentioned Blueprint. It has been mentioned several times. Uh, this is just one example of a very overall Blueprint. It means that it shows what's going to be assessed in relation to the learning outcomes and the different domains. For example, for year one, when we know the learning outcomes, we can uh, decide uh, which areas are going to be tested with the written examination, with, for which we should have an OSCE, and so on. And you can basically blueprint everything. You can blueprint just everything, but this is an overall uh, plan. So, principle six is that we have to have a program assessment uh, that's created for the whole program and blueprinted uh, against uh, the curriculum learning outcomes, and so that the assessment support the curriculum learning outcomes. So we have to show the students, the teachers, where we start, what's the starting point, and what's the final uh, destination. Otherwise, you cannot choose the best route. And final principle I'm talking about today is what we usually forget. And it is that we should use the assessment results for the uh, improvement work of the whole program. We should share the results with students, with teachers, the committees. Perhaps we should change the course content if there's an area where students really fail, lots of them fail, we should change the design. Or maybe we have to uh, revise our assessment content. Maybe the, the examination wasn't good enough. Or change how we teach, or, um, or change the assessment methods. So create a real uh, plan, do, study, act circle, quality circle for the assessments. All of this you are allowed it to take home, but what I, what I think it boils down to, what's really core, is how important the learning outcomes are. It's important to put a lot of time to think about what we want students to learn. It's about quality assurance for students, for teachers, for patients and the for society. So let's start to construct and build the road so that students show, uh, and show it clearly for students what we are going to. It may be easy, or it may not. Uh, I personally has been, have been a part of a, a constructing assessment system that wasn't easy. It wasn't quick either. But I have to say that as a teacher, it was one of the most rewarding, one of the most interesting uh, work I have ever done. And it's part of the lifelong learning. So good luck, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rita. Uh, next, we'll have students representative Joel Telka and employers representative Ermo Havisto. And they will comment the uh, renewal uh, needs of uh, medical education. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, from medical students' perspective, we have things going on pretty fine. Education is free, Kela sponsors your studies, it's safe out there and the weather is nice, for now at least. Uh, predicting, if something can be said about predicting future is that it's uncertain. Uh, we don't know if we have a social uh, and healthcare reform in autumn, whether our government will break up before that, or if medical students can work as doctors during summer leaves in the future. As AI 
uh, is soon in every device and service, and the amount of accumulation, accumulation information has far surpassed the capabilities of human mind, we should move focus more on the practical side of the profession. Of course, we need the basic theoretical understanding of human body and its functions, but as the evaluation has shown, we do that already in every university. To train the practical clinical procedures and tricks, we need supervision. With supervision should come feedback, which is essential to make students feel and be capable. Most of the students get to practice many practical skills during studies, but it's sadly uncommon to get feedback that, hey, now you can do wrist repositions on your own. We should move from the see one, do one, teach one, mentality to um, practice, repeat, and get an assessment. Depending on that assessment, you may practice more. Uh, to practice clinical skills, we need proper facilities. The simulation laboratories and their staff are important asset uh, in the toolbox of training a doctor. If we could also fill the simulation labs with other future professionals of healthcare system, we could produce even more competent future professionals. Uh, it should not be worried that medical school would turn into a vocational school. It's still in the law that a licentiate degree is a university degree. As much as we need vertical integration with students and professionals of other healthcare professions, we need horizontal integration. It is stated that health tech is the most promising future export uh, product or service for Finland. Where are all the doctors building new Nokias and Kones? Uh, our, our studies are often done on campuses close to the university clinics, where there are no at least visible en engineers, humanists, economists or lawyers. Innovation, nor change, do not appear in vacuums. Uh, I wish that some of the universities will work as the primus motors of this much needed change, as they have already the ecosystem around them. As the, uh, the growth of public funding for universities in Finland has been below the EU average since the millennia, uh, it's been negative for uh, the last 15 years. We have now less, uh, uh, it seems hard to do better with less money and more students. But universities have somehow survived the last cut to the budget. Because of the economic constraints, we should cooperate more. In the business uh, and industry side of life, you get savings from scalability. I believe that national curriculum, tests, learning platforms, and other innovations will be part of the, to of the tools to do more with less. Students' well-being is a common affair of the heart for many student representatives and faculty staff. That's important, but we need also to take some actions for the people who teach us. Currently, most teachers do clinical work, research, uh, and teaching simultaneously. Some of them even have families and ho hobbies, I have heard, not seen. <laughs> Choosing to teach as a career can be rewarding, but it's really demanding. I wish that one day our teachers' work is respected in practice as much as in speeches. Finland has been an ace in the statistics published by OECD. We were sixth in the global, global burden disease report measuring performance on the healthcare access and quality published two weeks ago uh, on Lancet. We should aim to produce best possible doctors with the best current evidence-based teaching methods and maybe one day our med schools are nominated among the best ones. Thank you. Dear Chairman, dear all, uh, I've been working as a CEO a couple of months in Satakunta Hospital District. When we started this evaluation process, uh, and during almost all that time, I worked as a medical director in the same organization. And as you see, you don't have to be a student to make progress. Uh, the key word is, uh, 
lifelong learning. Or was it long life learning? I don't know. <laughs> anyway. um, about my role in this team, uh, it was to represent working life and I, I also try to represent patient and population. And from that point of view, I think we must go to very deep in uh, basic issues when we think about the basis for the, the social and healthcare services, the basis for the existence of the whole system. And when we come to the constitution of Finland, the great constitution of Finland, which uh, guarantees certain basic rights for every citizen. And all, I take only two examples. Section 6, equality, which means that uh, every citizen should have adequate social and health and medical services uh, in good quality. And it should, shouldn't be dependent on, for example, where she or he is living, in what part of country. And of course, the section uh, 19, which deals with the right to social security, the public authorities shall guarantee for everyone, as provided in more detail by an act, adequate social health and medical services, and promote the health of population. I think there comes the basis for the services, and uh, according to that, uh, according to law, according to the constitution, citizens' needs will set requirements for the whole system. And the social and healthcare system, service system, is an instrument for the public authority to provide the constitutional services. And social and healthcare services, they must be planned and produced so that the rights guaranteed by law are met. That means the resources, resources we have and the availability and accessibility of services, they must be at such a level that uh, uh, we can provide and we can produce the services needed. And of course, the knowledge and uh, skills of the professionals working in that uh, system, also doctors, they must be at such a level that uh, the constitutional rights are met. I think that is the frame, the framework in which we should evaluate the uh, education of all professionals, also doctors. And then what about the needs for the future, renewable needs and uh, the need to develop and uh, improve the quality of education. Uh, from the point of working life, of course, we come to the, great, the greatest uh, social and healthcare reform ever, ever in Finland, ever in the world, maybe. And some key points, as key features in that reform, which I want to emphasize, Strong integration of services, that is one of the main goals of the whole reform. Uh, to integrate the social services, health services, primary care, special care, that is the main goal. And of course, that will change the environment where we professionals are working, where doctors are working. The role of a patient will change. It will be much stronger than at the moment. And the relation between, relationship between a doctor and a patient, that will also change. A doctor will be more like a partner uh, or more like a coach for the patient because patient is in main response for his or her, her health and treatment of sicknesses. Also, uh, due to the, inter the integration, we are more and more working as a member of a team. We are not working alone, we are a member of a team. And uh, additionally, usually, a doctor is a leader of the team. We put great uh, expectations on digitalization. And for reason, we know that there is a great chance to improve the efficiency, uh, the quality, and also safety of the services, and, but we must know how to use digital tools to get these, to, to achieve these goals. 
And the principle, patient first, we must accept it, we must adopt it. Uh, actually, at the moment, this principle, patient force first, is the main principle when we are building, planning and building new hospitals in Finland or anywhere. Patient first. And finally, we come to the basic thing. Uh, doctors, they are studying, they are training, they are working, they are for the patient at the moment and also and especially in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Joel and Ermo. Uh, now we will have a short break. Let's take 10 minutes break. We are running a bit late, but uh, let's continue at uh, 11.40.
We'll continue with the presentations from the universities and I think we go in alphabetical order so that we start with uh, the University of Eastern Finland and uh, Professor Jarmo Jäskeläinen, please. So good morning everyone. I'm uh, Professor Jarmo Jäskeläinen. I'm Professor in Pediatrics and I'm the leader of the medical uh, curriculum in, in Kuopio. Uh, we were asked to present our strengths and good practices for the future medical education at each medical school, and I'm naturally presenting the good practices uh, done at, at our university. First, planning of education. Um, I think our planning process is systematic, it's clear, it's clearly scheduled, uh, it has strong student involvement, and it always starts with previous feedback, uh, both at the subject level and at the study year level. We have a common faculty of health sciences, so it's not only medicine, it's also pharmacy, nutrition, nursing, and so on. Uh, we have a common educational committee, which enables synergy with also these other curricula, even, and even uh, curricula from other faculties, which enables multidisciplinary studies. We have nowadays detailed core content analysis in most subjects, and in some subjects it's a common uh, uh, analysis uh, with, with other medical schools. Then implementation of education. Uh, at the new curriculum uh, and at the preclinical phase, we have now integrated organ system based um, uh, curriculum. This means that we don't teach physiology, anatomy and so on separately. We teach them all together in a special classroom which enables team learning and close interaction with students themselves and with students and teachers. During clinical phase, we have mostly case or problem-based learning, um, which uh, enables uh, kind of uh, learning of good practices. We perform our clinical studies at several partner hospitals and health centers, so the whole healthcare network, uh, which enables uh, learning at different environments and, and students learn different ways of doing. There's not just one way to do things, there may be different good ways to do things. And in our own opinion, we have good support for modern teaching technology. We have oppari for students, we have oppitupa for teachers, and, and it works well. It has, has worked well for several years. Um, we have teaching nurses. Uh, they have a clinical background and they work as coordinators during clinical studies. They are invaluable support for both teachers and students. Most of our teachers nowadays have pedagogical training and those who don't have it will get it. We share good practices regularly. We have this key teachers system. Uh, it's a small number of teachers who, who meet regularly and they uh, take care of faculty development. We also have this pedagogy system, which means that all clinical teachers and professors uh, from the clinical school, they gather together and share good practices. This takes place four times a year. I think we have the largest intake uh, of medical students, but despite of this, we still have been able to maintain moderate group sizes. So our main uh, group size, or mean, mean group size, is from six to eight students per small group. I think this is rather good. It's not optimal, it could always be smaller, but I think it's better than 12. This means that our teachers teach a lot, but they also like it. Then competence and working life skills. Uh, I think there's a long tradition in Kuopio that we focus on good clinical skills. Uh, this means like resuscitation, acute cardiology surgery. Uh, it's also tested how, how the clinical skills uh, are obtained in these subjects. Uh, there are some clinical skill exams. We don't have yearly OSCE, which is not a good thing, but we have these kind of clinical skill exams in certain subjects. Uh, I think we were the first to have this clinical skills studio, Taito Studio, in Finland. Nowadays, I think. We have this in most medical schools. Uh, training of interaction skills. Uh, 
is also a long tradition, which still uh, uh, goes on. And we also use professional actors uh, in these uh, uh, studies. We have some multidisciplinary studies with nurses, social workers, and so on. Uh, they are voluntary, they, they will be, be, be obligatory, uh, and there's more to come. Um, this report is from uh, three years past. Um, so young physicians qualified in the beginning of this millennium were asked how education provides competence for working life, uh, for working in primary care. And I've, ne I, I've marked our university. Black is not that good, white is good. And I think we did reasonably well uh, for giving this uh, competence to working in primary care. And the same also for hospital work. So I think these basic clinical skills we have obtained reasonably well. Of course, this study was done actually five years ago. It was published three years ago. And I'm not sure about the current situation. I hope it is as good. Then continuous development uh, and renewal of education. Um, we collect feedback in different ways, but it leads to actual changes. And we have an active group for teaching development and assessment. We have a common, uh, common educational development committee for the whole faculty of health sciences, which I mentioned already in the beginning. And last but not least, we have a strong willingness to collaborate with other medical schools. I want to thank this Garvey evaluation. It has been most useful for us and valuable, and I think we take the message. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, the next uh, speaker is clinical teacher Jussi Meremies from the University of Helsinki. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, the organizers, and Thank you for sharing our uh, good uh, practices. Uh, I'm a, a program director of the medical degree in, uh, here in Helsinki. Um, <clears throat> as when I was listening Jarmo, I thought that, well, most of the, those, what, what, what he showed, I think we can, we can share and we can sign those as well as our good practices. I think we have a lot of common good practices in our universities. And that's why I thought that I could probably focus on a couple of things that we do a little bit differently. I think so. I'm not sure, but I think so. And I'm talking about, uh, and I'm focusing on uh, mobile learning and also uh, electives that we have now introduced a couple of years ago. Um, in terms of mobile learning, uh, in 2013, the Faculty of Medicine started to provide first year medical and dental students with iPads for their personal uh, studies. The hypothesis was that mobile devices such as tablet computers would be useful tools for helping students with their individual learning strategies. Uh, in 2013, there was little, very little data on that, and that's why we decided also to do some research on this subject. Uh, and simultaneously, we started a uh, research project on, on this. Uh, here, just I show you some uh, some uh, points to, to this uh, short time of period. I, I can't go in, in any further uh, deeper. Um, these are the uh, most important, important uh, uh, things the students do with their uh, mobile devices. The most important is note taking. What they also do, they do annotations and their own notes. They combine their own notes there. Uh, the second is information seeking from the web mostly, and then they download digital material like videos and uh, uh, text from uh, internet and use their uh, tablets for uh, learning. They look those, for, for instance, videos from those uh, devices. Uh, here are just a couple of samples how the uh, digital material looks in, in their um, uh, tablet computers. On the right hand side there's just one page of the uh, uh, electronic teaching material that one of our teachers have uh, prepared for the students. And on the left hand side there's a, a copy of a, uh, of a 
note page of front, one student where she has made a lot of uh, uh, extra um, highlighting and, and um, annotations and uh, to, for, for, for her to re learn better. <clears throat> when we, if we could put together all the observations, or some of them, we can say that uh, in, in terms of uh, digital mobile learning, students want all learning materials in a mobile device compatible digital format. And that's what we have tried to do very carefully. It's crucial that students to learn, they, they use to not do the note taking application, they use the, those applications and can annotate their, uh, those uh, uh, texts and uh, material. Uh, visuality of learning material is highly valued among students. Uh, and students share information together collaboratively in social media and in cloud-based cloud services. And this was something new that we didn't know that really happened before. Uh, I think everyone pretty much had their own materials, but now it's, it's much more shared in, in uh, social media. Uh, in, in terms of clinical uh, years, we noticed that there was a notable drop in mobile device use in teaching and learning activities in the beginning of clinical studies. That was kind of a surprise. Uh, uh, actually, some teachers actually prohibited uh, uh, using uh, these uh, devices in their uh, teaching sessions uh, for some reasons. Uh, and, uh, there, are, there were a lot of uh, uh, different kind of attitudes against, and some, of course, for the, uh, using these digital um, devices. But uh, bit by bit, these uh, uh, attitudes have been, been changing. And then something about the electives. Uh, uh, we have, uh, in our curriculum, we have um, 60 ECTs of advanced studies, and of those, 20 ECTs goes to medical degree thesis, and then 40 uh, ECTs were almost completely hidden in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the curriculum. We didn't know where they were. And when we had the curriculum reform in 2015, we de decided to dig out some of the uh, hidden uh, uh, is, uh, is ECTs and made these electives for, for the first five years. Altogether, 25 ECTs, five ECTs each year, and they are usually in 2.5 uh, ECT uh, um, study modules. And this year, this year we had the first time uh, courses on all five uh, um, uh, year, uh, academic years. On sixth year, we don't have uh, electives. Altogether, we have 55, 57 uh, different courses. And here are just eight examples of the topics of the courses. Uh, I, I don't um, list them all. I don't read them through. But you can see that they are very variable. There are very different kind of courses. And uh, we are very happy about the content of courses we have. And, and I think uh, we have been quite positive on this. Uh, we have had a lot of positive feedback from the teachers who do these uh, uh, courses and, uh, uh, and also from students who are attending. But we have had some problems as well, especially on logistics. Uh, these modules require uh, a lot of uh, work to, to how to uh, make registrations and then there are some cancellations and everything. It, it, it's a lot of work and we have thought that what, what would be the best way we still haven't found it. And this sp spring uh, we had to cancel some courses because there was so low number of participants and also uh, a lot of uh, last minute cancellations and no show was a kind of substantial uh, problem this year and we, that needs further actions. But uh, uh, I, I also will thank the organizers and, uh, and this opportunity and all this, uh, the, the work uh, that has been done to improve Finnish medical education. Thank you.
Thank you, Jussi. Interesting stories about what is being done. And the next one is uh, Petri Kulmala from O. Thank you very much. I thank the organizers also. And I think this is really excellent timing for this Garbi evaluation because in Oulu we are in, in the uh, stage that we have just started our new curriculum with the reformation and it's, uh, there is a basic structures, so there is framework, but it's still really flexible to new changes and this is perfectly timed for us. Thank you. So, uh, let's try this one. Does it work? Uh, so, there, is, there has been already continuous development as we had the 2011, the last reform, and now as I told, it has started, the first year is completed and they start on the second year, but, but clinical part is still uh, pretty much in the process of getting new learning methods and activated learning methods there. So, on planning of education, our strength, I think, has been that we all the time have had and have more and more interprofessional planning in there, especially we have long and uh, really strong collaboration with all the University of Applied Sciences and then also primary care health professionals. Uh, we involve student, students in every level of planning of education. Uh, we have and will all the time develop the feedback options, as including immediate, course-specific, academic year-specific, and curriculum-specific feedback. And, and this year already, it's, uh, it, was, it's, it has changed a lot, uh, somehow also related to this, uh, your evaluation. So that gave us already a lot of good directions. So then, I think what is really good in planning of education, I think that atmosphere and attitudes have been changing already, maybe five years or so. So people are more interested and evaluate or evaluate more, give more value to teaching also and student welfare, teacher welfare. And that's really good to notice. So then about the implementation of the education, what good practices we have. So based on student feedback, uh, as I told, the uh, atmosphere has changed and also this is reflected in feedback that motivated teachers, we have really motivated and good teachers, most of the teachers are motivated, but they struggle with the timing of their work, as we have heard from the report also. So, and also amongst the students, they feel that they have a good atmosphere for studying medicine in Oulu. So we have a unified campus area that's re really good, good for us. And uh, also we are, we have been using these activated learning methods as others too, but more and more. There is some people, there are some people who said we just should keep the lectures and traditional uh, tests after the course, but still we, we are fighting against that and we, we are trying to get these uh, people more interested in really developing their learning methods. One that was also picked up as, from the team that uh, we recognize doctor as a human being and this is also the area we can make more progress in future too to think that we are also human beings and we should meet the patient as a human being, not just as a doctor. So that's one really important aspect. Oh, we have had and we are getting more e-health in our, our teaching, like uh, one course of basics in e-health has been under planning for years and now it's first time this year will be available for medical students also and then we have uh, seminars on e-health and electronic systems uh, in the fifth year. Uh, we have had a really strong integration of studies with primary care units and there was a great plan to have this kind of uh, teaching unit in the, uh, in the city of Oulu but unfortunately they, they 
didn't have enough, enough money, so they stopped to produce that. But still, we are doing that in practice in every clinical year. So one of our, our good thing is that we have had this fifth year OSCE there already for maybe 10, 15 years, and also it's now maybe one or two times we have had in the sixth year also, and it's coming to fourth year. So this is what we are increasing there also in evaluation. So then about competence and working life skills produced by the education. So this is pretty much same in all five universities. So uh, a practical training and teaching is spread out to the health, other healthcare units. That's really good. So that there is a direct contact to healthcare. Then we have a diverse patient mix, of course. They're using the local healthcare providers. And <clears throat> this is really important compared to other disciplinaries that, that in, in Finland, the teachers are clinicians too. So teachers are clinicians. They know mostly what they talk about. And also in Olo, for example, we have 220 persons involved in teaching and only 75 of them ha are employed by university. So that tells how many people we have actually participating in teaching and most of them are clinicians. So then continuous development and renewal of education. So it's really now time for local and national change and collaboration and I'm really happy to be involved with other university with Medici project and funding by ministry. So, so this is where we can now also use this CARVI evaluation for the, for the development. So uh, we want to add the pedagogical skills training, of course, there as the others will, but most important, the student and teacher welfare is one thing we should really also focus more and more on. So, this is potentially one future doctor, future Finnish doctor. Thank you, Petri. That was a good picture. You can see that the key skills with the stethoscope and, and other, other uh, devices to look at the patient are still there. The next speaker is Vice Dean Seppo Nikkari from the University of Tampere. Yes, thank you very much for Garvi for this excellent report. And I will focus on things that we want to share and that Garvi has also recognized. First of all, planning of education. We have a vertically integrated curriculum that's systems based. And it's been there for over 20 years now. And, and uh, we have moved since that time. We have, of course, moved uh, away from specific disciplines into systems-based curriculum. So we have very strong collaboration between specialties and disciplines. And clinicians come already in preclinical studies to give their input. And we're very proud of our Center for Skills Training and Simulation. And, and it's brand new, it's, it's actually very fabulous. And we have close collaboration with the University Hospital also in using that. It has great infrastructure and, and it, we have very good possibilities and also ongoing interprofessional education. We have nursing students and we have talk about um, social worker students also to come work there. And, and there was a question of patient safety and we feel that this center is very crucial for patient safety. Implementation of education. We, of course, like other faculties, we have close cooperation with, with several health care centers and hospitals. And we have no one, not, not one of our, our teachers can participate in problem-based learning as a tutor without undergoing teaching. And, and we also have our own programs for staff development educationally. And 
when we come to assessment methods, we of course have the traditional summative tests after each block, but we've been developing uh, formative assessment consistently. And we have a long-term use of our own progress tests with nearly a thousand questions that have been developed to uh, answer to local needs of, of what, what a physician needs to know. Working life skills, uh, because from the first day, from the first week on, the, our students are actively involved with clinicians. They know exactly where they're headed for and what their future will be and what, what competencies they need to accomplish. And we also have an excellent internship guidance and support. What com when it comes to continuous development, uh, we have mandatory student feedback. They don't pass the, the course if they don't give the feedback. And this really results in changes to the curriculum. And we also have students participate in all these uh, committees that decide on the changes to the curriculum uh, based on feedback. We have very good communication with, with, um, with healthcare, with, with health centers, with, with local hospitals, with the university hospital. And what's, what's a wonderful thing is that the Tampere University Hospital uses our feedback for their employees who are actively involved in teaching so that, that, that this really results in something. The, we, we get, we get it's, 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 it's very strong, the feedback, when it comes to the clinics. And I think that was it. Thank you for the report. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's good that you're telling what you already are doing well. We tried to refrain from saying which university does what, but you're very welcome to tell it yourself. And uh, then it is uh, Oti Kortekang Savolainen, who's the director of the Center for Medical Education from the University of Turku. Thank you. Sharing instead of competing between medical faculties has been my slogan since I began in, in my present post as the director uh, five and a half years ago. I am also concentrating on things we might do a little bit differently and might help others. Uh, we are the one who has got the Center for Medical Education. And the only one in Finland. We have been working for 16 years now. Our tasks are curriculum de development, pedagogical education of teachers, mentorship program, feedback systems, etc., and also scientific work. I think a uh, practice to share could be also a categorization of learning outcomes into three categories. That is easy enough for even me to understand. Uh, I think we have a strong body working for this curriculum mapping, which might be starting now. We have a, a system of study or leaders. Educational leadership is emphasized. They work as a group under the chair of our educational dean. We hope that they get a holistic view of educational development and can show shadow regions in education. We also have a working life advisory board mentioned in the report. We, in planning of education, we nowadays have a practical approach to collaboration in education and research. We have no ambitions to merge organizations. Health Campus Turku comprises of the medical faculty, the universities for applied sciences, both Finnish and Swedish, the Obo Academy University, Swedish, and the hospital districts of Varsina, Suomi, Satakunta, and Vasa, and universities and schools in those regions. Uh, this has been, this collaboration has been very fruitful and, and we are uh, getting more and more into professional education all the time. Uh, the newest one is collaboration in health technology education. Medical faculty has built a bridge between the University of Applied Sciences and IT Sciences of Turku University. This is something I've been already sharing with one medical faculty, this idea in Finland. 
We are just about to inaugurate our new, new Medicina Day building, um, which will house Health Campus Turku. Uh, much of the education of the Turun Ammattikorkeakoulu will happen here in Medicina Day, and rest of the social and welfare education of Turun Ammattikorkeakoulu will move very, very near Medicina soon. In implementation of education, we have tried to emphasize the well-being of students and teachers. Our unit gives courses in medical education, and they are available to all teachers and supervisors. They don't have to be university teachers. They can be anyone who is supervising our students or our specialist doctors or even CME, doctors working with CME. We even have a ECTS, we have web-based course which works well in, in remote places. We have collaboration with International Faculty Development Community. I'm actually, for the moment, the only Finnish member in AMI committees, and I had the responsibility for the fourth Interprofessional Faculty Development Conference in Helsinki last summer as a pre-conference of AMI. It's not mentioned in the book that I, I spent half a year as a visiting professor at the Center for Medical Education at McGill University in Montreal, and still have very close contacts to Montreal. And I, uh, Montreal has shared many, many good practices with me, and I've tried to share them further here in Finland. I've uh, introduced the term näyttöön perustuva lääketieteellinen koulutus, evidence-based medical education, and, and käypä lääketieteen koulu, lääketieteellisen pedagogiikan koulutus, also here in Finland. We have a mentorship program for all undergraduate students, which is mandatory, and we teach reflection. This is something you can read further in the report. I think we have good practices in our widely and for a long time distributed medical education, which are something to share too. In working life skills and competence, we teach professionalism. It comes from Montreal to all medical and dental students. We have had um, for at least 25 years uh, an elective path of research for medical and dental students, and nowadays we also have a pedagogical elective path. A pedagogical elective path. Our students take the course in medical education together with teachers. This is the first structured peer medical education program in Finland, and such a structured one is rare elsewhere too. Uh, one of our newest inv innovations is Sote Academia. It's collaboration between all seven faculties of the University of Turku. Uh, no, no intentions to merge organizations here either. A 25 ECTS module in, in social and and uh, healthcare affairs anticipating the reforms is just to be started. It's available to all students of all faculties and in the open university. I think this is something that we could share with others too. In renewal and continuous development, I think our feedback system is still on a innovative. It really binds, a, it really builds a loop because even the influence of feedback is insured and evaluate, evaluated, so the students can see how feedback matters. On the side of this systematic feedback, which is needed for auditing processes like this, we have emphasized the, uh, me, uh, the importance of, of uh, spontaneous feedback in many ways in Turku. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oti, and uh, I think that uh, all the representatives from the schools can now come here in front and, and uh, we can start a joint discussion on strengths and good practices for future medical education. It's so good to see each university being so proud of the quality of your teaching, and, and you have good reasons to be proud about that. Um, when we came to uh, interview you in uh, December, so our last question was, if uh, you now can make a wish to Santa Claus, one wish to Santa Claus, what would you like to have? And, and now, uh, it, now Santa Claus has arrived, we still cannot discuss resources, we don't talk money, we haven't talked money here at all, we have talked content, but uh, now Santa Claus with all the presents that you have brought, from your own school, so what is the one idea that you would like to pick from others?
from these presentations that uh, you would like to take to your own university? What is the present you would like to pick? Who would like to start? Yes. Yeah. I want to pick the mentoring program from, from Turku. I think it's excellent and I think we have to do the same in Kuopio. Mentorship program for, from Turku to, uh, to Kuopio. Great. Yeah. You stole my words. But <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that's very, very good. We, we actually we have tried to adapt that. We made some attempts uh, a couple of years ago, but we did, really didn't put any enough effort on that, and we kind of failed, but now we have a new attempt. I hope this, will, this time it will go better. Failing is one way of getting, getting a better exactly, program, exactly. isn't it? Yes. Yes, Jarmo. Seppo. Seppo, sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, th I was very interested in the digitalization that was presented from Helsinki, and, and I, I think we can learn from that. Digitalization from Helsinki for the, for the uh, students. I think it's wonderful that they have peer teaching as one result of that. Yeah. Good. Petri. Yeah, I, I agree with Jussi and Jarmo, and uh, most of the ideas I, I saw were really good. One thing would be what OT showed that pedagogical, pedagogical training that's uh, specifically made for medical teachers. We should have national training courses that kind that we can share. We can do them locally, but we can share them. Especially you have that uh, internet-based course to to ECT credits, so that's easy to take. Good. Oti. Uh, well, I, I, I would like to take the examination and assessment system from Tampere. I'm looking at it from inward to because my daughter is studying medicine in Tampere. So I would like to have that one. Good. You're welcome. Santa Claus has arrived and you will get these presents that you wish for. Just go on and, and take them into practice. Um, what I would like to ask you now is, what is the next step that each of your universities will be taking toward better future doctors? What is the big thing you're going to do? Jarmo. We actually started developing our program already during the evaluation uh, last autumn, actually, when, when we were discussing you and, and you were evaluating us. So we discovered things that we have to do better. Uh, so, of course, the core content analysis for the whole curriculum, that's, that's our big thing. And then evaluation comes next, so how we assess uh, uh, our goals. And also this mentoring program, student well-being, we, we now have, we have already had group discussions and we have plans how to, how to do things better. So this so, evaluation has gotten things moving there. Yes. Yeah. That's very good. And the, and the alignment that, that uh, we very strongly, that the evaluation group very strongly brought up, the alignment of what is being taught and what is being assessed. Yeah, that's right. Sounds like it's mm. part of your plan. Yeah. Good. You mm, actually, we okay. also started during this process, and uh, first of all, we started uh, uh, interprofessional teaching is one of our main focuses now, what we are trying to aim in the near future. And the second is, uh, of course, uh, curriculum mapping. And mm. we, are, we first need to find the best tool for that and then just do the work. No small feats either. When you talk interprofessional teaching, what professions are you thinking of? So far we have been involved in this process uh, social sciences, uh, pharmacy, pharmacy and uh, uh, all uh, uh, University of Applied Sciences in, in Helsinki area together. Yeah. Interesting. Not engineers yet. Not yet. No. Yeah. Then Sepp. Yes. Um, the Kairi report is a, is, is a very good um, thing to start with, with when we start the med digi or med igi or whatever that, that, the, <laughs> that the Ministry of Education has funded for five medical schools. It's when, when we decide on our core uh, learning objectives and, and stuff, I, I think this is a very good handbook for that. Yeah, excellent. Better. Yeah, I will, I will agree with that as all of us stay in that uh, committee or that, mm. how would you say, who 
will proceed nationally on, on that. And one thing we decided a uh, few weeks ago was that the uh, one major thing is to do in each subject this core content nationally. Yeah. So that's one major point what we had to do. So what we also do the, is, is the curriculum mapping and also where we put effort is mentoring and also I think welfare of students and teachers. Mm. So we are in progress in that. Very good. Can you, can you give more detail on the welfare of teachers? Is there anything special that you're doing? So they are starting one group of, uh, it's actually started from the clinical teachers themselves. So they have now get together like three times and they have started to uh, be more active. And then also we have increased uh, those uh, um, seminars where we try to get more and more uh, teachers involved. And then we, uh, under planning, there is a, a questionnaire for all clinical teachers to first map all the areas where, we'll, where we could and need to get better. So, Oti, what will you wish for? Because everybody is wishing something from you. <laughs> oh, <my. coughs> I must say that our dean hasn't seen this report yet, so I haven't discussed with him yet. Okay. Because it was... Because it only came out today. Earlier than yes. this morning. So I haven't discussed with him yet what, what he thinks of... Of, uh, of the future. Um, there's so much going on in our uh, faculty now, but I'm also very happy, very, very happy about this Medici project. We got the 3,2 million euros uh, for doing things together, and I think mm. it's, here is the team who is actually, <laughs> yes, actually the core team who has, who has been Planning already what we are going to do, and, and it will be a very good platform for this if the deans think it's important to have this curriculum yeah. mapping. Very good. I know you have been preparing sort of for this uh, for this discussion uh, for for this question about what will you do, and and then as part of the uh, part of the uh, making public the results of this uh, of this. Uh, approach that we have had with Garvi, uh, you will be interviewed, or have you already been interviewed for the Finnish Medical Journal about this? Yes. They, will, they will publish yes. a special yes. issue Next in the... Uh, no, there's... Uh, it, that will, I, I think that will come in... They, there will be a short thing this week, and then there will be a larger one in August. Yes. It's, it's okay. already been published. I, okay. I it. Have you seen it already? Yeah. Good. I haven't yet. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, the Journal of Finnish Medical Association will call us next week and, and, and ask specifically what we're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> and to and the decision process isn't that very easy that I decide on what we're going to do as a medical faculty. Exactly, <laughs> I understand that. And what, that's what the Wyote says, that you, you have to discuss with your dean first. You cannot yes, say publicly yes. what you're doing. I suggest doing. Yes. that our deans will get some time to discuss also these matters. And we won't be saying anything what we are going to do. Today. But I, 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 think, I think it's quite unique, I, uh, and uh, I'd, I'd like to hear Karvi's uh, ideas uh, of this. It's quite unique that an evaluation process like this becomes so public in the, in the eyes of the, of the uh, uh, profession that is being trained. And, and it, it's also an example of why, why this is such an important uh, step in in, in Karvi's work as well, that, that, that it's, it's quite unique that you have, you have done such an extensive evaluation. So I, I'd actually like to hear a little bit from you. Um, about this? this about, about, uh, about the renewal and, uh, uh, and the making public of this report. Uh, yeah, yeah, actually all evaluation reports uh, uh, and evaluations carried by the FINEC are, are always, always public. Yes. But uh, in this case, I think the unique part was just that, that the also the unique, unit specific reports are, are now public. Yeah. In previous uh, evaluations, uh, we have sent um, the short uh, unit specific reports just to to the to the universities. Yeah. Yeah, but this was the first time, and we we would like to increase the trans. Tran uh, 
transparency <laughs> of the evaluations and the effectiveness of the evaluations. Good. Yeah. So the universities have been brave enough to say that yes, we, we can be watched from the public eye and it also means that you, give, you, you get feedback from places that you don't necessarily expect to get feedback from. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that that was a very good idea to, to be transparent and, and publish all these results for or, or each university. I think it was a very good idea. Yeah. Is there anything the audience would like to, uh, like to ask? Yes. I would like to ask about, I'm Eva Pyora from the University of Helsinki. I would like to ask about the pedagogical training. It has comes up from all universities. You kind of say that it's, it's, we provide pedagogical training, but in the evaluation report, we, it's quite alarming that uh, quite many medical teachers are not, cannot, cannot attend courses. Uh, first of all, should medical faculties provide tailored courses for, the, for all the teachers? Should it be tailored? I know that in three universities it is tailored for medical, uh, medical teachers. Or should it be kind of general courses? And should, how can we provide the courses to such a huge amount of people. And thirdly, one concept I haven't heard during this, uh, this lovely <laughs> occasion is scholarship of teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. Medical education is, I mean, we have huge amount of research and all pedagogical training and development should be based on research. And it's not a, well, we had Amy last year. Finland is kind of a superpower of um, medical education in, in the Nordic countries because we have lot, lot of, lots of projects going on. I think these should, two things, pedagogical training and scholarship of teaching and learning should be always combined. Thank you very much. I think, I think we can take your first question to, to everybody. Should all, all teachers get pedagogical training? How, how many of you would say yes? Okay. The, the next one was, uh, how should that be provided? Uh, because, I mean, uh, there are 200 plus teachers in all of your schools and only about a third of them are employed by the university. So do you have answers on how to arrange training for everybody who teaches medical students? Yeah. Well, yeah. actually I think most of our teachers nowadays um, who work uh, most of the time in teaching, they, they must have pedagogical training and they have it. Either they have done it already or they are doing it at the moment. And at our university, the pedagogical training is, is, is um, delivered by, by, the, by the whole university. It's, it's not specific for the medical school, but it's also good to see uh, other students from, from other faculties and other professions to, to, to do the same medical training. It's, it's, it, there's also pros in that. We have had also special uh, pedagogical courses for, 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 for the medical student, uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the medical school. Uh, I think it was about five years ago. We can do it again. But actually, I think why the me clinical teachers wouldn't uh, go to the medical training by the university, I think the the common explanation is they don't have enough time because they have to do clinics. Well, I think that has to change. So teaching is their main job. They have to, have, they have to get time for this. It's important. And I think we are getting the message. So also clinical teachers are doing it more now. Yes. And then it's often in many, many uh, cities, like, like in Kuopio also, the campus is, outside, is uh, away from the uh, main university where they give the pedagogical training. Well, 300 meters. So it's oh, not okay, that that's bad. right. Kuopi, yeah, yeah. Kuopio is not one of those. It's Oulu that's one of those. Yes, sorry. Other comments, yes. In, in Helsinki, I think the, the training has now been more generic for all disciplines or, uh, in, among university, and I think Disciplines are so different that I, I think that, I, uh, well, of course, this is the medical perspective. I, I'm, I, I admit that, but 
well, the, uh, because we have so many co competencies that really affect the working life. I think that's the difference, and I think that should be seen in, in the uh, education and training, and, and we should get tailored courses for medical educators. Equal but different. Equal but different. Yes. Yes, I totally agree with, with you, because, because I, I underwent a teaching on, on, uh, on, on problem-based learning when I came back from the United States in 1993, and I didn't understand what, what, one word of what they were saying, but when our own medical teachers took control of that program and, and told us what it was all about, then, then things began to happen. It has, be to, it has to be translated not only from English to Finnish, but also from generic concepts to m concepts that are relevant to the medical teaching. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think the question is for clinicians part of you and also some teachers and professors. So how to make pedagogical training attractive? Mm. And one uh, option is, or one... Uh, yeah, how to, how to resolve that would be research. Yes. And if that's evidence-based and they see, well, I will benefit that, I can do research on that, or that's really evidence-based, that probably will motivate. And this is also in the list of Medici. Yes. And I think, Oti, you, you will be the one who's able to answer the last part of her question. And what was the last part? <laughs> Yeah, uh, we have had in Turku uh, specific courses in medical education since 2003, so for a very long time. I think nowadays over 350 teachers have gone through this and 150 have done this to ECTS web-based course. We educate so many teachers that the Faculty of Education could never take the, the, our enthusiastic teachers there, so we have to have our own medical education. And as told, I have tried to introduce the term evidence-based medical education and käypä lääketieteellinen koulutus into this country. So I honestly do think that we get something from studying with others. I have done the long course in university pedagogy also, but our medical teachers need, need specific uh, education. And one reason is that I can always read and see and get the feedback that they get, get so many good networks they can discuss education and discuss teaching. And this, I have heard, has a lot of meaning for the, the welfare of our teachers. Yes. That's why I think we should have, or we will have our specific courses. We are not going to... So there are, there are two things that have been very well aligned with this evaluation. One is, one is the uh, Medici uh, group and the, and the funding, funding for that. And the other one was the AME Congress that we had in Finland last summer, and uh, I understand that a, a number of teachers from each of the medical schools participated and came back with ideas. Exactly. Good. Any uh, sort of final comments that you would like to make as we are waiting for the minister to arrive? <laughs> yes. Please tell who you are. Seppo Soinila, Vice Dean, Turku. Uh, as you know, Santa Claus comes once a year. <laughs> and before that, he sends the elves to spy whether the kids behave. Now, we've done, we've made a lot of good decisions. We seem to be ready to learn from one another. And the bottom line question is, now we should really agree in concrete way how to follow up this process. How to follow up this uh, thing, and this is something actually that we have been discussing also as part of the evaluation. Um, uh, sometimes Carvi makes a follow-up of, uh, of its work, and uh, I understand that there's not really a decision yet made about this evaluation. But uh, I think the medical schools might be interested in doing something themselves. Who would like to answer? How to follow up? I mean, you have now publicly told what all good things there will be happening. <laughs> yeah, I can say one thing. Then, in, in Medici, in, in the end of by the end of 2020, 
but already or 21. We have to, yeah. So we have to make a report <laughs> what we have done with that money. Okay. So although we don't talk money here, we haven't been talking money in the evaluation. So now money talks, and you have to deliver, and you're going to report together what's happening. So we look forward to that, and maybe that's also enough for Karvi. Yes. I wonder what happened with the minister. She apparently isn't, isn't uh, arriving. I wonder what happened with Harry. He's waiting for the minister in the, in the hall. Um, this is uh, sometimes the case. And uh, I think that uh, what we'll do is we'll send Kirsi to look for Harry now and uh, ask the, uh, ask the uh, representatives from the universities to give our best regards to your faculties for very good work in, in uh, participating in this and, uh, and we look forward to uh, your progress in this area. We'll be watching you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We will be seeing what happens, and um, yeah. um, the number of reports that have been printed for this occasion is about a hundred. Yeah. Yes. So uh, uh, I, th I think it, that it will be good if if you need some more reports, you you just take along any. Any uh, that are left in here and take them to, to whoever wants them. There is a link on the web page of Carvi to the full, uh, full report uh, in digital form, and the presentations from here will be also downloaded yeah. in Carvi page, so you can, uh, you can uh, look at them. And uh, while we wait for Harry, can I, can I get my slides again? Because then I would do one thing. Five extra copies to each medical school. Thank you. So, what I'm going to do... Oops. Uh, how do you get... Okay. The minister is coming. We'll wait for her. Yeah, Hannele goes on from here. I was going to play you the Hobbit song. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Mariukka. Okay, today we have, we have discussed and talked a lot about the strengths of, of medical education and the quality and uh, the current state of, of medical education in Finland. And, uh, and also a lot of good practices uh, have been delivered. Uh, the evaluation team has also identified uh, development priorities and as the evaluation is carried out according to enhancement-led principles, the report also includes uh, uh, recommendations. Recommendations for medical units to support the, the future work, but also some recommendations for um, for decision makers and uh, to ministries. And now we are pleased to hear closing remarks by the Minister of Social Affairs and Health, Pirkko Mattila. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm, I'm very sorry I'm coming to help my speech in Finnish. I didn't realize that um, we have so many international guests. I'm sorry about that. And sorry about I'm a bit late because um, I, you probably have heard about our big reform in, in, <laughs> in social affairs and healthcare. And um, I think we made a big step today. Um, we are moving forward 
on this, on this uh, reform. But so, now I'm going to switch the language. So, <clears throat> eli arvoisa yleisö, tuota, uh, olen taustaltani siis myös toiminut terveydenhuollossa ennen, ennen poliittista uraa. Minulla oli ilo tavata entinen, entinen tuota, niin, työkaveri. Uh, olen to, toiminut, siis tehnyt pisimmän työuran OYSn päivystysleikkausosastolla anestesian hoitajana. Mutta te, arvoisa terveydenhuollon ammattilaiset, aloitan ajattelun tai tämän puheen sillä, että meillä jokaisella on vastavalmistuneena ollut ehkä niitä riittämättömyyden ja epävarmuuden tunteita ja niitä hetkiä, kun olemme olleet aloittamassa työuraamme ja varmasti se ensimmäinen työpaikka on meillä kaikilla mielessä. Mutta olen myös sitä mieltä, että hyvällä peruskoulutuksella aina aloituksen epävarmuutta on mahdollista hallita ja hallita hyvin. Jos mietitään nuoren lääkärin työtä tänä päivänä, on se varmasti erilaista silloin, kun itse olen valmistunut sairaanhoitajaksi ja aloittanut sairaalassa työskentelyn. Tänä päivänä tietoa haetaan sairauksista. Vaatimukset, keskustelutasot ovat varmasti aivan erilaisia kuin 30 vuotta sitten. Toisaalta myös ammatillinen tieto muuttuu, tiedon tulva on suurta, ja näistä ja näihin peruskoulutuksen tulee vastata aina. Tulee osata valita, arvioida, käsitellä ja soveltaa juuri oikeaa tietoa erinäisistä hoitoketjun vaiheessa. Ja nyt hyvin akuutin sote tavoitteena on nimenomaan parantaa hoidon saatavuutta, mutta tarjota myös potilaalle valinnan vapautta oman hoitonsa suhteen. Pyritään entistä enemmän siihen, että asiakas on palvelujärjestelmässä keskiössä. Ja se, va- va- se asettaa uusia vaatimuksia sosiaali- ja terveydenhuollon ammattilaisille. Lääkärin työn perusta on edelleen diagnostiikka, hoidon valinta. Mutta diagnostisen ja hoidollisten taitojen ylläpitäminen ja kehittäminen vaativat tulevaisuudessa entistä enemmän tiedonhaun, viestinnän, tieteellisen viestinnän osaamista. Tutkimustiedon hyödyntämiseen ja näyttöön perustuvan lääketieteen hallinnan tulisi kuulua jokaisen ammattilaisen perusosaamiseen. Mutta tämän ohella vuorovaikutuksen merkitys ei vähene, eikä yhteistyö muiden ammattilaisten kanssa. Ja tiedämme, että tässä me olemme erilaisia toisille, ne ovat enemmän luontaisia, mutta kaikki eivät ole seppiä syntyessään, niihinkin on koulutuksessa panostettava. Mutta arvoisa yleensä olen saanut kunnian olla ja tehdä kansainvälistä yhteistyötä tässä asemassani ja joka paikassa olen törmännyt siihen, että suomalainen lääketieteen koulutus todetaan hyvin korkeatasoiseksi, arvostetuksi ja turvalliseksi ja se on siis laaduntaa ihan varmasti. Ja tämä tarkoitus meillä varmasti on kaikilla pitää mielessä tulevaisuudessa. Palvelujärjestelmä muuttuu, ajattelen tällä hetkellä niin, että sote-uudistus etenee. Ja sen muuttuessa tulee uusia mahdollisuuksia hyödyntää palvelujen tarjoajia ja palvelutuotannon mahdollisuuksien laajetessa. Se tarkoittaa myös sitä, että opetus muuttuu niiltä osin se käytännön opetus. Yliopetus, yliopistot vastaavat jatkossa lääketieteen opetuksesta. Ne tekevät jatkossa palvelupaikkasopimukset ja niillä on siis keskeinen rooli koulutuksen laadun ohjaajana. Potilasturvallisuus on osa sosiaali- ja terveydenhuollon palvelulupausta. Hoito, jota meidän terveydenhuoltomme tarjoaa, on turvallista, laadukasta ja vaikuttavaa. Valtioneuvosto on tehnyt periaatepäätöksen ja julkaissut vuonna 2017 potilas- ja asiakasturvallisuusstrategian vuosiksi 17-21. Tämä strategia korostaa terveydenhuollon turvallisuuskulttuurin näkökulmaa, esimerkiksi virheistä oppimista syyllisen hakemisen sijaan. Strategia korostaa myös johdon sitoutumista sekä asiakkaiden ja omaisten osallisuutta potilasturvallisuuden varmistamisessa ja edistämisessä. Potilasturvallisuuden merkittävyys on hyvää näkyä lääketieteellisen koulutuksen, myös peruskoulutuksen opetussuunnitelman sanoituksessa. Tänä vuonna hakeminen lääketieteellisiin tiedekuntiin 
on muuttunut yhteishauksi, ja lääketieteen opintoja on edelleen tavoitellut suuri joukko nuoria. Millaisia lääkäreitä yliopistossa kasvaa? Tänään julkaistun raportin johtopäätöksissä todetaan, että jatkossa yhteisymmärryksen saavuttaminen lääkärin työn ydinelementeistä on tärkeää. Minkälainen on suomalainen lääkäri? Mitkä ovat taidot, asenteet sekä valmistuneen lääkärin tulevaisuuden roolit? Mitä muiden terveydenhuollon ammattihenkilöiden laajennetut toimenkuvat merkitsevät lääkärille ja lääkärin työlle, mutta myös moniammatilliselle yhteistyölle jatkossa? Millaista on terveydenhuollon johtaminen? Näistä asioista tarvitaan yhteinen näkemys. Ja unohtamatta eri yliopistojen ominaisluonteita raportin suositukseen siitä, että lääketieteen opintosuunnitelmat olisivat kansallisesti sisällöllisesti sisällöltään yhteneväiset. Siihen on helppo yhtyä. Kiitos tästä mahdollisuudesta lausua nämä sanat teille tänään. Lämpimät kiitokset ministeri Mattilalle ja menestystä jatkoonkin nyt näissä tärkeitä päätöksiä, kun teette koskee tätä meidän ja liittyy tähän meidän päivän teemaamme hyvin, hyvin tiivisti. Kiitos paljon. Ja kiitos myöskin yleisölle, teille osanottajille aktiivisesta osanotosta tämän päivän ja osallistumisesta tämän päivän tilaisuuteen kuuntelemisesta, keskustelemisesta ja, ja tuolla myöskin tuossa sosiaalisessa mediassa on, on hyvin aktiivisesti tätä keskustelua käyty. Medisinariliitto taisi tehdä tässä ihan tämän tilaisuuden aikana pienen kannanoton tai tärkeän kannanoton asiasta ja tietysti oli vähän valmisteleet ehkä sitä etukäteen, mutta tuota on, on tultu monella tavalla. Tämä on hyvin, hyvin paljon saanut huomiota. Myös yleen sekä suomenkielinen että ruotsinkielinen svenska yle on, on tuota, ollut tänä päivänä tekemässä juttua ja on ollut televisiokameratkin mukana, että tuota, ja radiossa on jo uutisoitukin. En tiedä televisiosta vielä tähän aikaan, mutta tu, seuraamme näitä sitten tätä keskustelua. So I want to thank you all for, for your active participation in this seminar. But uh, on behalf of, on, of FINEC, I wish to thank our international, our excellent international evaluation team, specialist team for, for it's for your very, very, very great contribution, this evaluation and this very important discussion in Finland. And thanks to the representatives of the faculties of medicine and uh, medical student associations for your great commitment and contribution to the implementation of the evaluation. As we have heard, each university faculty medical school has many good practices of education planning and implementation that others can share and, uh, as we heard, are, are very eager to share. And in the name of uh, enhancement-led evaluation, the development is now uh, underway in medical education programs. You have the ball now. The impact of the evaluation will be improved when the faculties will consider together what will be done together and in, in what kind of timetable. So we hope that the results of the evaluation will fly and the development will get air under its wings on national level, university level, faculty level, medical school level and so on. And um, we have already heard that there are hopes for a follow-up evaluation. We are very happy for that. And um, we, we, we will take this into consideration while we prepare 
next evaluation plan for the years 2020-2023. But thank you very much for your participation and uh, have a nice summer. Oikein lämmintä ja hyvää kesää kaikille. Kiitoksia.